Hi, everyone. This is week two of Intro to Religious Studies, and we are going to be dealing with the effigy mounds of Wisconsin this week. And uh, I mean this as a way to continue our discussion about some of the underlying patterns about religions. Um, after this week, we'll start heading into the scriptures, the Hebrew Bible and the Ramayana. Um, and well, it'll be very kind of a wordy for a little while, but this week it's not gonna be wordy. It's gonna be more about religions and landscapes. Um, some of you are, might be from Wisconsin and might know something about the effigy mounds. Um, others of you might not. Uh, and I mean this as, as kind of an opening lecture for the book, uh, the chapters that we're gonna be reading on the mounds, uh, and then also our discussions. Um, one thing to get through is the that mounds can be somewhat dis, uh, maybe difficult to enter into at first because there are no words, right? We don't have text coming from Native American groups a thousand years ago or more who constructed these mounds or built them. So in some ways we're without the things that we are used to rely on, which is language uh, and stories that make sense of them. Um, so what I'm kind of going to be asking you to do is kind of take a step back. And there's going to be some details about religion uh, among uh, ancient Native American groups that we don't know, but we can also glean a lot about um, the mounds in a, in, a, in a larger kind of a way and about what it says about people um, making sense of their world and imposing that sense uh, and their beliefs on the landscape itself. Um, and I'm hoping by the end of this week, we'll start to see parallels with ourselves. Um, when uh, European settlers came to Wisconsin, there were thousands of these mounds, maybe 20,000 effigy mounds. Um, and so it was extremely notable. And our book begins by talking about some of the earliest explanations and stories as people tried to make sense of all these mounds. Um, now, one thing to realize is that effigy mounds are often quite small. They're not something that strikes us immediately as um, monumental. They're not pyramids out of stone or anything like that. Um, but where they are impressive isn't in the individual creation of mounds, but in just the thousands of them that once existed in these vast fields of mounds. And I'm gonna show you some examples of what these looked like. Uh, in just a second. But it's more the landscape of mounds that is really important and really impressive rather than individual mounds. All of these mounds were burial places, all that we know of. Um, people were buried in them, um, uh, and that was uh, a primary use of mounds. But then in the process, uh, they developed these effigy, this effigy style of burial. So, and by effigy, we mean an, an image, right? So. Uh, it would be in the form of a panther or a turtle or a bird, or um, there's uh, uh, water spirits. There's all kinds of different uh, images that were made into, uh, in, that were given to these mounds. Um, let me look now, I'm gonna switch and share screen and look at some examples of these mounds. Um, oh, one other thing I should say is that as you're, um, as I said, you'll get to have kind of an introduction to the mounds and interpretation of the mounds for Monday. Wednesday and Friday, we'll talk about the actual mound builders and what these mean. Um, but as far as the dating, you can look to page 55 in our book. And there's a table there sh showing the different groups. And you'll note that effigy mounds are largely from the woodland period, uh, late woodland. Uh, so it's, a, it's, it's not like for all, for centuries and centuries or millennia, there were mound builders, uh, effigy mound builders, but it's from this one period, the late woodland, which is say um, uh, 700 to 1200 AD. That's when there was this kind of flourishing of these mounds. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, um, uh, so first thing to note is that effigy mounds come 
uh, largely from Wisconsin itself. And that makes them kind of a unique story for here at, here at Lawrence and also for being in Wisconsin. Um, you can see on this map that uh, uh, the Effigy Mound area is largely the southern half of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, it bleeds over a little bit into Iowa um, and also a little bit into um, Illinois in the south, but mainly this is a Wisconsin thing. And that just is the way it happened. Obviously, that, that Wisconsin didn't exist in the uh, ancient Native American world, but that is where these fall today. And so I think that's part of also why I like this, um, this part of intro to religious studies is that it gives us a chance to think about uh, a local, really unique local um, story about religion that we can see here. Now, some of you, I know a lot of you are first years, um, but you might have gotten or you will have a chance to get up to um, Lake Winnebago and High Cliff State Park. And if you, it's a good place to go, especially in the spring um, uh, as it gets a little bit warmer. Um, and, but this is what it looks like. You get up there, you look out over Lake Winnebago and over on the right, uh, you can see some of the buildings from on College Avenue in Wisconsin, but largely you have this expanse of a lake. Um, High Cliff is known as High Cliff because it is, there's the Niagara Escarpment. Right, the same layers of rocks that gives us the Niagara Falls over in upstate New York gives us a set of cliffs here. It's a, it's a, a set of rocks that continues around um, and has some various outcroppings. And here uh, it's on the side of Lake Winnebago and it gives us some, uh, some impressive cliffs. Uh, and that's what gives you that view of the lake itself. Now, up here, there are mounds. These are kind of hard to see in some ways, but they're there. And if you jot off the trail just a little bit, you'll see a set of mounds. So there's a panther mound. Uh, it kind of looks like a panther if you look at it in a certain light. Um, and then you have these conical mounds, which are um, sometimes older than the effigy mounds. Uh, and you can see, again, they're not, we're not talking about huge sets of earth movement or anything like that. They are just these gentle rises uh, in the ground. And this is where uh, uh, these are these Native American burial grounds. Again, from like 900 to 1200 AD. So we're talking way before Europeans arrive uh, uh, in the Americas um, uh, and this, this period of time when they were being built. Now, the other thing to realize is that as you'll see, as you see more, more photos, is that these are all overlooking bodies of water Right, so that's you know up here on top of these cliffs where we like to go for today for hikes. That's where Native Americans kind of built these uh, burial places, and uh, you can see these remains. Now, if you drive through uh, on the road to get to High Cliff, you'll come across a lot of new houses and golf courses, and I think these are some reasons why we don't easily notice effigy mounds because you'll see these. You know, we we participate in so much large earth moving um, and to build these golf courses with with hills and berms in them, right? These are all things that we do with bulldozers and big, large uh, equipment. And mounds kind of seem to fade into the background when you've got this kind of, uh, this all this going on. Uh, if you just stop at a gas station, you'll also see, you know, large berms and mounds. These are just you know, people dug into a hillside, moved dirt and built a gas station. So we're just surrounded by earth movement in ways that I think makes it hard sometimes to see the evidence of uh, smaller scale earth movement that happened uh, in the ancient Native American world. Now these were very, could be very crowded. This is another place uh, at Nitschke uh, Mounds County Park, uh, more out towards Horicon, if you know where that is. But you can see here from the um, from the map just how crowded all these mounds could be, right? They're just kind of built one on top of another. I've never seen them quite so crowded. Um, so this was a popular, something that um, these sites would have all kinds of mounds crowded together. The other thing you see from this map is that they end at certain lines, right? And that's because there's property lines and that's, there were fields of agri, modern fields of agriculture and a lot of mounds were just plowed under. And so they're just, 
uh, invisible, uh, uh, invisible now. But you can see in these little patches that we still have just how crowded they could be. This is what that looks like. Um, you know, it's very hard to Instagram mounds, I've found, because they're not built for a single viewpoint. They, you know, our, our, our cameras give us a way of thinking about space that is backdrops for flat images. Obviously, that didn't exist in 1000 AD. And so these mounds really become more evident and you get to see them as you walk around them, as you kind of imagine a higher viewpoint. Um, but they're not something that often turns up very easily just in a flat image. So here what you see, you can see a lot of undulating out there, and those are uh, that crowded field of mounds that uh, you can see kind of drawn out in the last image. Um, continuing, you know, I took a, uh, I, I've always loved mounds, but I took a trip this past summer during pandemic, uh, and it was a good social distancing trip, and here is uh, uh, just kind of a highway berm, right? Again, this kind of overpass and uh, on the right and the left, you've got massive piles of dirt that were built up uh, in order to support just the infrastructure of, of, of our life. And I think we're used to this kind of earth moving um, on a large scale. And again, mounds call us back to think about a much smaller scale world of earth moving. Uh, here is a different kind of mound. This is an intaglio. It's in in it's it's a it's a negative of a mound. So you, if you this is going to be a panther, and when it rains a lot, this I'm going to show you something that isn't my picture. But when it rains a lot, you get something like this. You can see the the panther kind of fill in the the little depression and become a uh, the shape of a panther. A very few, this is I think the only one that now survives, but several of these were noted in earlier times. Um, if we go a little bit further south, this is Lake Kashkanan. Again, there's an attraction to these large views, these panoramic views of bodies of water. Um, and you see that again in a set of mounds. Uh, in this case, this is a golf course, but here's a, a bird mound, a bird effigy mound. And you can see the shape there, um, the wings, kind of pulled back um, into a, a, a smaller bird. Um, moving further now to the um, east, I'm just kind of giving kind of an overview of these places where you see mounds. This is the Mississippi River between Wisconsin and Iowa. And up on those bluffs on the Iowa side are the biggest, the largest field of mounds that have survived. Um, and that's the Effigy Mounds National Monument is here now. But again, you note the attraction to these grand views of the landscape and bodies of water. Um, there's these bear mounds, a series of bear mounds, and you can see that there's kind of clipped the grass so you can kind of see them. Again, they're not something that comes through in flat images so well, but you can start to see the curves and imagine a mound there. Uh, often you're helped to see these mounds by a kind of uh, mowing of the mowing of the grass and the shrubs so that you get kind of higher and lower. And that's how some of these lines are made to stand out for visitors today. Uh, here's another site where there are some spectacular mounds. This is in the Madison area, the Mendota Mental Health Institute, right along the shores of Lake Mendota. And you can see right in their, um, their logo, they've got a bird, an extended winged bird. Um, uh, on top of one of those mounds is this eagle effigy, largest Indian mound of its type in Wisconsin. It has a body of 131 feet and wing spread of 624 feet. So we're talking huge. Not many of these survive. So here you get a view of it from the body of the bird kind of looking out at the, at the wing, moving over there to the left. And of course it goes in the other direction as well. This gives you a sense of just how big these could be. Um, here's the head of that bird. Um, uh, it would then the wings go out in both directions, but you can see with the kind of uncut area right there where the head is. Um, one more site to look at, and this is the um, Arboretum in, uh, in, in Madison. And you can go on a kind of a series of trails. And if you look carefully, you'll see the mounds kind of noted on the, on, on the map. Unfortunately, these can be hard to see because they're more interested in the, the the, the trees and the undergrowth in this case, um, but out there in this 
area are the mounds. And in this case, it wasn't a large body of water, but it was a spring. So um, this is something that we'll talk about in class, but there's you know, these parts of the natural world where there were resources, where there was food, where there was water, are gonna be the ones that are kind of marked by these burials um, and the, uh, the effigy mounds. And I think that eventually what we'll start to talk about is how these mounds uh, relate, to, um, uh, relate to the natural world and understandings of the human place within uh, the natural world. Okay, so that's a short introduction. The main thing I wanna say is first of all, just to make a point about how present these are all around Wisconsin. You may not have noticed if you're driving through or if you're new to Wisconsin, just coming to Lawrence, but it's kind of a, uh, there are thousands of these that still exist and there used to be tens of thousands um, in the landscape. Um, uh, they are survivors of, you know, pre-European contact. They're ancient. They're most of them were built between 900 and 1200 AD. So we had, kind of have to think back into a world that is largely gone. And what are the tools? And what are our ways of understanding these kinds of mounds? For Monday, what you're reading are these chapters talking about sort of the earliest explanations for these mounds. And then on Wednesday and Friday, we'll talk about the meanings of the mounds themselves. Um, but that gives you an overview of what these are. All right, I'll, um, and I'll also be posting a question for you um, to think about for our Monday discussion.